Happy Easter, everybody. Let there be light. You can be seated. Come on, everybody. Aren't you grateful for a risen Savior, everybody? Come on. Man, he's so good. God is so, so good. So glad you're here to worship with us on Easter. I want to take a moment. Welcome our campuses. Victory is one church in multiple locations with a campus in Newcastle and Meadville. And so we love you guys so much. Come on, Cranberry. Welcome them as well as those with us online today. Now, I grew up a little differently than most. I grew up with four brothers, and my, uh, the dogs were all male. My mom was a woman, but no one acknowledged it. And so we grew up differently. So it's because my brothers have issues, okay? Just my older two brothers are Damon and Lucifer, Damien and Lucifer, but other than those guys, they're fine, the other ones. But here's the thing. At, at, at Easter, you know, Chris, Easter baskets with candy and all that happy stuff, well, my mom and dad would put bags with four sticks of pepperoni in the refrigerator with your name on it <laughs> and, and a loaf of, of Fifth Street bread. It was this hard bread that, you would, that we would literally beat each other to death for. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, we would beat each other in half to death for a piece of pepperoni. I mean, I don't, you know, you have a thousand kids, things don't have a lot of money. And so my mom would get a stick of pepperoni. She cut that so thin you could read the newspaper through it. So to get four of those, mm, I mean, it was like change your life. So I got up, I was maybe, I don't know, eight or nine, ten maybe. And I, I go up and I get, I, I, I go into the refrigerator because I, I don't care about that other basket. And so, I, and I see my brother's bags are in there. And I thought, if I took one from each, they would never know. And that's what I did. And so it was like six, seven in the morning. And then I realized if they catch me, they will kill me and bury me in the backyard. So that morning, I ate their three and mine before I did anything else. She said, well, did it make you sick? I was a happy Italian. <laughs> and uh, you said, I thought there were five boys. Well, baby Jesus, he wasn't at pepperoni eating age yet. So they never knew. I waited till I was about 30 to tell them <laughs> because I think it, they would, it would have caused a great amount of friction. But the fact of it is, most of our Easter's are centered around certain traditions. My hope for every one of us today is that you celebrate a resurrection, not just of a Savior, but how it applies to my life and your life every day of the world. And so the title very simply is this, a resurrected life. A resurrected life. Not just a resurrected Savior, but how do I live a resurrected life? The first three simple points today. The first one is simply this. Your eternity and the resurrection of Jesus. How your eternity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, here's the reality. Where every one of us spend forever, eternity, hinges on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And I want to help you to understand that today. But uh, I want to do so with an illustration. Now, this, this rope I'm about to pull, let's, just for the sake of our, our, our message and the illustration, I want you to think of this rope as going on forever, it's eternal. It never stops. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going, which is what happens to every living human being when they die. There is an eternity that never ends. And Jesus said some incredibly important things about this forever. Now, we also have this little bit of time on earth that's illustrated in this red zone. And... What I find so easy to happen for me, and I'm sure perhaps you do as well, is we'll spend all of our time with this and make no plans for this, which goes on forever. And, but what you do in this red zone determines what happens forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Sometimes people will be unwise with money and particularly, say, toward retirement. And people will say, well, you know, you weren't very wise with those choices. But... Here's what I want you to understand, and my hope is to give you a context with this ongoing illustration today. In this red zone, we have a lot of important decisions that we make. I mean, we, we, there were a lot of choices just to, to have this service today, and then afterwards, we're going to eat at my house. Michelle cooked, and she's an amazing cook, and so I'm going to eat in bad, bad food. <laughs> bad food. It's Easter. And so there's plans you make. 
uh, you know, you're going to go to school. You're, well, what college will I go to? And my, what, what job? And, and you get married. And, and, and the one I think is most funny, the, the most, is that at the end of our lives, we get this little piece about that big, that big right here, and that's retirement. And people figure out, well, I'm going to plan my whole life for that so that I can travel or not starve or whatever. And when you think of the, the wise and unwise choices that people make in the red zone, I don't know that anything is more unwise than this thing called time, ignoring that at the outcome of it is an eternity. It's so un, it's un, unimaginably important. God gave us his word. In his word, he said this. It is appointed for every human being to die one time. And after that is judgment. Period. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what I feel. And it, well, I want to come back as a butterfly. Yeah, that's wonderful. You won't. <laughs> if I could come back as something, I know it wouldn't want be any of my four brothers. Other than that. But right at the end of this red line is a judgment, and no one will escape it. And my hope today is to help you to see how the resurrection of Jesus is the only thing that makes, you, makes it possible for you to enter into the rest of eternity with confidence, knowing that the judgment that awaits us all has been taken care of. So when you think about that, Here's, here's what I want you to see. This is the reason Jesus had to die. And, and my hope today is to help you see the why behind Easter. Easter sermons are kind of like going to a movie where you know the end. I don't like going to movies where I know the end unless it's The Godfather. I, that I enjoy watching over and over again. And my wife just appreciates that like you can't imagine. I can't get her to watch it over and over with me, but that's because she's selfish. And so I'll leave it at that. No, she, she actually has, she's normal. She's normal. She married into crazy, but that's all right. There's a reward in heaven for her. I love you, Michelle. Thank you for putting up with the crazy, not just in me, but we got family crazy. Anybody got some family crazy? Come on, man. Anyway, why did he have to die? I want to know why. I, I, I went to church as a kid, but if you ask me, why did why, why, why did Jesus have to die? What was the, why did he have to resurrect from the dead? I couldn't have answered you. And my hope today is to answer the why about the resurrection of Jesus so that we don't end up celebrating a holiday and a resurrection and get to the end of this red line and enter into an eternity without having received the very reason that he came. I'm going to read it to you in the book of Hebrews. In the New Testament, chapter 9, it says this, in verse 24. For Christ did not enter a man-made holy place, remember that, which was a copy of the true tabernacle in heaven. But he entered into heaven itself to appear now before God. Now listen, on our behalf. Let me give you a little bit of context. The man-made temple or tabernacle they were referring to is the one that God commanded Moses to build in the wilderness. God gave him exact specifications. You can read it in the book of, of Exodus. And he had to build it exactly according to what was, it, it was a, a copy, if you will, of what would be in heaven. In that tabernacle, that's where the sins of God's people would be covered, not forgiven, but covered. And the only way it would happen was through this sacrifice of an innocent animal. Here's the thing that you must understand about our God. He's holy and he's righteous. And he cannot, he cannot have sin in his presence. He cannot because he's holy. He cannot. It's not even an option. But here's what I want you to see. That God in his mercy, God in his kindness, dealt with that issue. Instead of God just casting us away, as sin has stained all of us. And it doesn't matter if it's just a little or a lot. Because the Bible said the minute that, I, that sin comes into my life, I'm spiritually dead or separated from God. And can I tell you this about death? Because I've been to a lot of, of funerals. I've never been to a funeral where the person in the casket is more or less dead than the last one. Dead is dead. And he said Christ did something 
in that heavenly tabernacle on your behalf. Let me read it to you because when you see this, you'll understand the gravity of why he did it. If you listen and read the words of Jesus, you'll find out that he said very clearly at the end of this life, there is an eternity that everyone will face. At the end of this red zone, there is a judgment. And that judgment is an eternity with God or without God. Now, what I'm about to say may not be politically correct. However, I'm not a politician. Jesus said there is a heaven to gain upon death and a hell to shun. And if you don't know what to do in this thing called time with a Savior that's, that's sacrificed himself, you will enter eternity on your own. Now, let me go on reading in Hebrews now. You could see the context that he entered into this, if you will, copy of the one in heaven. Uh, that is, Jesus went to the actual one in heaven. Verse 26 says this. If like the priests, those are the ones in the Old Testament that offered up the animal sacrifices. If like the priest, going into the tabernacle again and again had been necessary for Jesus, Christ would have to die again and again, just like the lambs were constantly put to death. Die again and again from when the world even began. But now, but now, once and for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age, listen, to remove sin, not his, mine and yours, to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And as it is appointed to men once to die, and after this, the judgment. He's saying that because we all die, and there's a judgment that immediately follows that, the end of your red line, that he went into heaven itself and he sacrificed. You see, he's no longer, if you will, the lamb that was offered up by the, by the priests. Jesus is actually the Lamb of God, but he also is the priest that would offer the sacrifice. The Old Testament is filled with about 300 scriptures that point to Jesus. The entirety of the tabernacle and all of its articles of worship point to, to Christ and, 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 and parts of his life and his sacrifice. In the, in the prophecies of Daniel, he actually speaks to the very year that Messiah will die on a cross. He doesn't say a cross, but when Messiah will be cut off. It's remarkable. And the Old Testament keeps pointing you again and again and again to this. And so the priest would offer a, a lamb without spot, without blemish. And, and it would cover the sins of the people as an innocent lamb would die. And that's what Jesus was, the lamb. When he, when he appeared on the horizon at John's baptism... When he began his public ministry, John saw him and didn't declare him to be the son of God, the ruler of the world. He said, behold, the lamb of God who will bear the sin of the world. And but Jesus was not just the lamb that was slain, but he, he shed his blood when he hung on that cross. The justice of almighty and holy God was satisfied. God in his mercy and love, when he judged me guilty because he's righteous and he can only do righteously. His mercy, the Bible said, boasted against his judgment and he wrapped himself in a human body born of a virgin for one reason, that that man, Jesus, all God, all man could live a sinless life and be put on a cross by sinful people and all of the wrath of God that was due me, God poured out on himself. He judged me guilty and then he took my punishment. That is the message of the gospel, but that wasn't it. Jesus died on that cross for my sins and yours, and he was buried for three days. And when he rose from the dead, he rose victorious, and he conquered death. And what my hope today is to help you to see the power of that. In fact, after he had just risen from the dead, Mary saw him, and she went to embrace him. And he said, Mary, don't touch me, for I've not yet ascended to my God and to your God. What is he talking about? He's no longer just a lamb, now he's the priest, the high priest. of The Bible said he's the high priest of the covenant that you have with God today as a child of God. And he took his very own blood, not into a, an earthly one made of man's hands, but into the heavenly tabernacle itself, into the presence of Almighty God, as he offered up as the lamb and as the priest, his very own blood for you and for me. And again, listen to what it said. He died to remove your sin by his own death as a sacrifice. 
This is so unimaginably important. I, I wish there was a way for me to, I ask God to help me to help you see the gravity of what you do in this red zone. It matters eternally. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. If Christ has not been resurrected from the dead, then your faith has nothing to it, and it's useless. And you are still, listen, guilty and under the death penalty of your sins. The sin of man has given me a death penalty at the end of this red line, whenever it is. And he said, if Christ was only a teacher and he died as a, as a righteous man, but not the son of God, and he's still in a grave somewhere, then you are still lost in your sin and under its death penalty because no one has paid your debt yet. It's why Jesus said some of the most, what today would be, it would get him canceled. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one, listen, no one can come to my father except through me. Why? Because no one paid that debt. You can't pay it, I can't pay it. Going to church won't pay it, religion won't pay it. Getting sacraments of a church won't pay it. Only the purchase of a savior without the resurrection of Jesus, our faith is absolutely useless. It's a joke, it's a game, it's a scam. All of your eternity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. And without that resurrection of Jesus, my eternity is without God. The second point is simply this. The resurrection of Jesus brought eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus brought you eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, I want you to see how clearly it's written. And this is the testimony God has given. Listen now. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Not in your good works. Not in your, your, your best efforts. Not in a church, not in a religion, including this church. Listen. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in the Son, and he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. If you leave this earth without the, the price the Savior paid, then you go on your own. That's why this is so critically important that you understand it. And God paid an enormous price for the privilege we have to come to God by Christ. The prophet Isaiah, some 700 years before the coming of Jesus, one of those many scriptures pointing to him said this, pointing to Christ. This is actually God speaking to his people. Isaiah 1.18, he said, come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. He wants to settle something about my past and yours. Listen. For though your sins are as red, are red like scarlet, I will make them. Listen, listen. I will make them. Not you will make them. I will make them. Not a church will make them. I will make them. Not a sacrament of a church. I will make them. I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like scarlet and crimson, I will make them as white as wool. What's he saying? In this red zone of time, there is no way for me to unload myself of the death sentence of my sin. And he said, but I will make you to the place to where no matter the depth of sin you may have walked in or the depth of sin another who harmed you may have walked in, he said, when you come to me, I will make it white as snow. No matter how desperate you may be, no matter how many mistakes you may have made, whether you get up for 20 years in a row and curse God. He said, though those sins be as red as scarlet, I, I will make you, I will make you, I will make you, I will make you. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 16, a scripture we all know, but very often don't read the next verse because the next verse will disabuse you of the nonsense of religion. In John 3, 16, it's, it's it, literally Jesus said, for God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son, that he gave his one and only son, listen now, that whoever, that's for, this, is for any, this is open for every human being, that whoever believes in him will not perish or be lost, but have eternal life. Everybody say eternal life. Listen, that means when you leave this earth, when, after receiving Christ, you enter into an eternity 
with him. Everyone will live eternally. It just depends where. It's what you do with him that will make that, de- make that uh, can actually make the decision for you. It's so, so very important. Whoever believes in him will not perish or be lost, but have eternal life. Now listen, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it or judge it, but to save the world through Jesus. Jesus didn't come to point out how horrible we were. We didn't need God for that. I think the depravity of man has never stopped in human history, even to this day. I think it's pretty clear the depravity of man. But he said, I didn't come into this world to condemn you. I didn't come into this world to put a religious burden on you. I came into this world to pay for you, to purchase you, to pay the debt you couldn't pay. I came into this world to save you from your sin. There are only two ways that you will face death in this life. When the end of this red zone happens for me or for you, there are only two ways to enter into this eternity that lasts forever. You will die in your sins or having been forgiven of them. If you try to earn this, if you start with, well, you know, I think I'm as good as most or better than most. And I think, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm a pretty decent person. I, if, you're, if your answer as to why you think you have eternal life where you'll spend it with God and not in his absence starts with you, you'll come up wanting. For the Bible said everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. No one can redeem themselves. That's why the message of Christ and the redemption of of, of our lives and his death, burial, and resurrection and the mercy of God is the greatest love story ever told. That he paid the debt I couldn't pay when I had nothing to offer him. Totally undeserved. And he rescues from the sin debt that we all have shared. It's my heart's desire for every one of us today to understand that what I choose in this red zone, what I choose, not God, what I choose in this red zone will determine my eternity. What will I do with the Savior, Jesus, whom the Bible calls the unspeakable gift? The unspeakable gift. The gift too wonderful for words. Eternal life is a free gift that cannot be earned. And the moment you think you can earn it, it ceases to be a gift. My hope for every person under the sound of my voice in all of our locations is simply this, that you answer this question. What is your confidence at the end of that red line when you enter into that eternity that will never end, that you'll be in the presence of God forever? The third point simply is this. Your resurrected life. God intends for you, for me, to have a resurrected life. So here's two simple questions under this. What does it really mean to follow Jesus in this life or in the red zone? What does it mean to follow him? Does it mean religion? Does it mean I have to hate my life, that I just have to not do anything I enjoy anymore? Is that really what he died for? What does it mean to follow Jesus in the red zone? Do you know that God has four desires for you, four desires for me? Whether you love God or curse God, acknowledge God or deny him. It doesn't change his love for you. And I want you to see that in this red zone that God has four desires for you. The first is that you would know God. And by the way, these four desires are baked into how we operate as a church. We want you to understand first how desperately God loves you. And this church exists to help all mankind, every human being. Know that God loves them unconditionally. It's an unconditional love that you can't change. And in that unconditional love, he died for me and he died for you. And now he gives me the choice of what will I do with him. And God has four desires for every human being. And the first is this. The first is this, that you would know him. Not religion, not about him, but an intimate relationship with God where he calls you his son and daughter and he's your heavenly father. That's intimate. And then he said, I want you to find freedom in your life. Jesus said, to whom the Son set free is free indeed. He wants you to live your life where your yesterdays no longer forecast your tomorrows. Where the people who who maybe injured you before you had any choices in this world. A lot of stuff happens in this red zone that's unfair. And until your yesterdays no longer forecast your tomorrows, you will live in, in bondage and not in freedom. And Jesus said, I came to make you free from not just your sin, but the effect of it. And the effect of other people's sin against you. 
He desires to make you free. He said, but then thirdly, God wants you to discover the reason or your purpose. Discover your purpose. What is the reason he put me on planet earth? What am I designed to do with my life, designed by God to do? Do you know that you can discover that? Do you know that when you walk with God in the red zone, you can find out the reason, the purpose of your life beyond paying bills and figuring out a vacation and getting your retirement in order? That there's a purpose bigger than just living, paying bills and finding fun. It's broader than my life and your life. And until you find that purpose, and then the fourth thing is that you will make an impact with that purpose. You'll act on it. You'll live within it. And you will never know freedom in this earth. You will never know joy and contentment in the absence of living within the way God has designed you and the purpose he's given you and living it beyond the circle and circumference of your own life. That's what it means to follow Jesus in everyday life. For many of you today, following Jesus means taking a simple next step. Next weekend at all of our campuses, we're going to have water baptism. So what's, why are you bringing that up? Let me tell you why. Every place where someone gave their life to Jesus, the next step they took was they were water baptized. Well, I was baptized a baby, it's all good. And I'm sure it was wonderfully sacred for your family, but that's not water baptism according to the word of God. Water baptism is what you do after you invite Christ into your life. And no matter how smart you were as a a little baby, you weren't that bright. (laughs) You see, today we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Next week, for those of you who have already given your life to Christ and not taken this next step, or perhaps those of you who will do so today, take your next step and be water baptized next week. Why? Because that's when you celebrate your resurrection. Water baptism is an outward expression that we're commanded by Jesus to take that is an outward, open declaration to all that Jesus is now the Lord of my life. He died openly. And this is when I say, I, I've decided to follow him. And I go into that water, if you will, dry. I'm immersed, covered in him, and I come up as a resurrected child of God. It is an outward evidence of an inward working. You're declaring to all that the only way I get to heaven outside of this red zone is because I've given my life to the one who gave his life for me. Those next steps are so amazingly important. So next week, next week, every person who has given their life to Christ, either today or in the past, you get to make another choice of what you do in the red zone. And please remember this. Every step of obedience toward God is a step into freedom. Freedom from the things that the enemy of your soul wants to harm you with and is already harming us with. He said, I've come to make you free. Then lastly, what does it mean to receive Jesus in the red zone? What does it mean to invite him into your life? What does that actually mean? Listen to what Jesus said about the resurrection life available to every person under the sound of my voice. Listen, in John 11, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's not talking about physical death. He's telling you that when you come and receive me into your life to be the Lord of your life and the Savior of your sin, you will never taste death or separation from God. Your body will stop. The moment that happens, if you're a child of God, the Bible said you leave one house and you go to another in in the twinkling of an eye. The only people that taste death on this earth are the ones that remain. Those of us, we've all lost loved ones, and it stings. But for the one who knew Christ when they left, the Bible says it this way, to be absent from their body is to be immediately present with God. The fear of death is the greatest fear known to humanity. What happens at the end? And you don't have to hope and you don't have to wonder. Easter is a celebration of a resurrection that wasn't meant to stay with the Savior but to be deposited in my life and in your life as you make him the Lord of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses, I want to give you the opportunity to invite Christ in your life to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you a simple question. If today you drew your final breath on the planet and and, and, and slipped into an eternity, what would you say to God? What would be your confidence that you were able to have your sins forgiven? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, 
Do you believe that he died on that cross for your sins and was buried in your place and mine? Suffered in your place and mine? Bore the wrath of God in the punishment that was due me and due you? And then he conquered death. And he rose from the grave victorious. And he offered up his own blood as the Lamb of God on the very, in the very throne of God to pay the debt for the sin of man so that you could become a child of God, a son and daughter of the living God, your sin debt canceled, so that when you die, you'll immediately be with him, not because of your good works, but because you've received Jesus, the unspeakable gift, the gift too wonderful for words, the gift that no man can earn. If you earn this, it is no longer a gift. It is the gift of God, eternal life. It is the gift of God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses, if you've never invited Christ into your life or you're not sure, I'm not asking you if you're a good person or if you're religious or you're a member of a church, including this one, or you had sacraments of a church. I'm asking you, have you received the Son? For he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son doesn't. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never invited Christ into your life to be the Lord and the Savior of your sin, or you're not sure and you'd say, Pastor, I want, I want to know today and celebrate his resurrection by having my own. I want to invite Christ into my life, the living Son of God. And by the way, he turns no one away. No matter how, if you will, red our sins are. He said, I'll make you white as snow. And I'll cancel your debt because I paid the debt you couldn't pay. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, you'd say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. In a moment, I'll ask you to do something as simple as acknowledge it through an uplifted hand. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. This isn't about your heroics. It's about his. And then I'm going to invite everybody here at all of our campuses to pray a prayer out loud and together with you right where you're seated. It's not some dead religious prayer. You're inviting the living son of God into your sin-stained life. Listen, and he turns no one away. No one. And you'll leave this place today. A child of God, your sin debt canceled as you receive Christ to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, only the campus pastors are, are, are viewing. If you've not yet, you say, Pastor, I don't know that I've done that or I'm not sure, but please include me in that prayer. With every head bowed and every eye closed as our eternities hang in the balance, I would ask you, what will you do with Jesus? Pastor, would you include me in that prayer? Right where you're seated at all the campuses. If you say, I desire to be included in that prayer, would you lift your hand high right where you're seated and I'll pray for you. Do it right now. 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 Your eternity hangs in the balance. Don't, don't go out of the red zone without a savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You can put your hands back down. One last moment. You can see I'm not, we're not here to embarrass you or single you out. If you've not yet raised your hand, you say, Pastor, I, please include me in that prayer as well. I, 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 I want to receive Christ and I haven't or I'm not sure. Include me at all of our campuses. One last moment as every head is bowed, eye closed. Say, Pastor, I, I want to be included as well. Raise your hand right where you're seated and I'll pray for you also. Do it right now. Right now. Thank you. Thank you. This is the best, most important decision you've ever made in your life in the red zone. If you raised your hand or you should have at all of our campuses, I'd like you to pray this out loud where you hear it with your own ears and we're all going to pray it together with you as you invite Christ, the living Son of God, into your life to make you brand new and your sin debt to be canceled. Pray it out loud where you hear it and we'll pray it together with you. Say it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross and he did it for me. He paid my debt. He bore the wrath of God for me. He paid for my sin. He died in my place. He was buried in my place. And he was resurrected from the dead to eliminate my guilt and the death penalty of my sin. Jesus, I receive you now to be the Savior and Lord of my life. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin debt is canceled. My burden removed. And when I die, I am heaven bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. 
Amen, amen, amen. Come on, everybody, give them a hand. Best decision of your life. Would you stand together with me? We're going to take a moment and worship God on this resurrection day one more time. It's not going to be long, but this is the most important part for many of you because it's a next step. Prayer partners are here in the front. For those of you who aren't used to church here at Victory, when we start singing in just a moment and worshiping, you're going to see people moving all over the room. Here, here's all that's about. For those of you who need prayer, they're going to come meet with a prayer partner and be prayed for. We believe in a living God that meets needs now. For those of you who gave your life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to come and tell one of them. Say, I, I prayed with Pastor John and tell them and they'll help you take next steps. But around this room, you'll see there are crosses and there are tables that have communion elements on them. For many They'll step over to the communion elements and, and hold it in their hand and receive communion and what represents the body and blood of Christ as you're thankful today for his resurrection. And on that same table, there's cards and pen, little pencils that you can write down a prayer request or what you're believing God for or, or a next step you're taking with God and then take one of the pins and pin it to one of the many crosses. So as you worship God together, Follow him and take your next step. For some of you, it might just be going to a cross, pinning it down. I will follow Jesus. I'm being baptized next week. Take that next step. As we now worship together and celebrate the resurrection of a Savior. Come on, everybody. Aren't you thankful for a Savior? The Savior of your soul. Come on. Let's worship God.